This is eyata.com. Primetime Sports. All the time. And now from Times Square, crossroads of the World Wide Web, and sponsored in part by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, it's the Wrestling Observer Live with Dave Meltzer. How's it going, everybody? Dave Meltzer here. For the next two hours, we're going to be talking pro wrestling. In fact, we're going to have the Honky Tonk Man on for the first time on the show, and he is a is very outspoken on a lot of topics. So if you want to talk to him about his stint in the WWF, which is probably what he's most famous for, uh, actually he wrestled all over. He wrestled in uh, Calgary for many years. He wrestled in the South, uh, Alabama circuit. He's actually a cousin of Jerry Lawler, which a lot of people know and a lot of people don't know. Worked uh, for WCW for a little while, and uh, actually was back at the Royal Rumble for about a minute. And uh, talk about uh, his views on the current wrestling scene, his career. Uh, you can join us in uh, and call us up in about a half an hour. Of course, we've got Brian Alvarez here, Figure Four Weekly. Just finished the issue, I'm presuming, last night. How'd it go? Hey, it went pretty good. good. I like how Honky actually emailed us to remind us that this was going to be a no-holds-barred interview. <laughs> yeah, it's like zinc, right? Like something right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's got a lot of... Uh, I, I read something that he wrote to uh, some people at WCW, and it was it was just hilarious about the current wrestling scene. We we'll probably <laughs> talked to him about his... <laughs> Um, very outspoken, we'll say that. So it should, it'll be very, it will be an interesting show. Uh, it's, and, um, yeah, last night was a long night. One of those uh, nights when the computer doesn't work and it's Tuesday. Oh, that's good. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was it was quite a night, but uh, I'm alive. Uh, actually, the issue turned out all right. Um, and I woke up today and got all of my uh, XFL demographics. And uh, after looking at the XFL demographic breakdown. It was even sadder. I don't know if you got to look at the thing I wrote, but it's I looked actually... at the uh, WCW one from uh, Monday. I didn't see the XFL one yet. Okay. It's actually I was actually surprised the... to see that up there last night at, like, midnight. I well, was going, man, see... Dave must have been done three hours ago. Here's some uh, no, what happened on the website. No, what happened was is that um, the program to print the envelopes mm -hmm. for, for foreign was, like, shut down. So I had, like, two hours to kill at, like, midnight. And I was already done with the Observer. So it was like one of those things where I got to stay up, and I might as well uh, go through the. You know, I was going to do that today anyway. I might as well go through that. So, hmm. so that's what that was. But um, no, the, when you look at the demographics of the XFL, it's even sadder than the ratings drop because they've gone from the the first week on NBC. We talked about it. You know, they had the the strong wrestling audience and the strong teenage audience, especially and uh, young adults. You know, twelve to twenty four. That was their kind of the group they expected to get. They were going to have the big lead-in for Saturday Night Live. Well, anyway, the second week, the 12 to 24 age group just plummeted um, down uh, 70 percent, 71 percent. Yikes! Uh, and now the prime age group is uh, 49 plus males. So for X, for XFL. Would that mean football fans? I don't know if it just means people who don't go out of the house on Saturday night, mm -hmm. and that no one stays home to watch the XFL, or if that means football fans. No, but I mean. The the way the the uh, TNN game actually skewed fairly low, and I'm attributing that to the fact that it was promoted so heavily on uh, TNN, which is a wrestling station. The TNN is promoting so heavily with those ridiculous. We've got pop commercials that actually are. Uh, I don't. I can't believe they're effective. Yes. But but TNN skews younger, so they actually had a younger thing. Uh, UPN did about the same as they did the first week, no real difference. But the NBC, yeah, I think that it was. I think that it. Um, it's more of a of an older football audience of the people that are still watching, but that that wrestling audience is gone. I think it's gone on all on, on all the shows, really. Yikes! So that's not good. Um, no, they um they're going. We to did a uh, by the way. I want to mention the poll on the website we did yesterday. Speaking of XFL, it was uh, what fans figured the chances of success were. Would it last this season, and would it be around next season? And it was uh, yes, fifty one percent. No, 49%. So it's like split right down the middle. Then it would be back next season? Yeah. Really? I'm surprised it's 51% up. That thing will be back next season. I think the odds of it being back next season, um, I mean, it's too early to say for sure, but, um, you know. Uh, I kind of dropped know. this weekend. 
I would say that the uh, the uh, I mean, if it was just the ratings alone, I wouldn't really you know I would say that it's too early to tell, because if the ratings don't drop again, they're they're not all that bad off. They're not mm-hmm. they're not well off, but they're not that bad off. Uh, but the ratings probably will drop again. But um, I mean, just based on the reaction of the media and the reaction at NBC, you know, and having that emergency meeting, to me, I think they've half-assed made their minds up that you know, barring a miracle, that uh, they're going to go through with the season and then. Kind of like whisk it away. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, that's certainly the certainly impression I got. How will Vince uh, handle that? I don't know. Maybe just like quietly let it go away. Yeah. And just you know, I mean, see if it goes through the season, and they just don't talk about it ever again. It just kind of like goes away. You know what Maybe I mean? they could do a, a stipulation. If uh, this particular team wins, the league must shut down forever. <laughs> <laughs> Remember why, like when WCW did that with Nitro, NWO would get Nitro. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We should uh, look at uh, SmackDown from last night at uh, Nassau Coliseum. I heard that it was uh, it was a sellout crowd, but not a very responsive crowd. Uh, let me look at some of the the notes here. Uh, see SmackDown. Um, okay, they announced Triple H announces the stipulations for the main event at No Way Out. Honestly, uh, we think about this. It's they're going to do three matches. Best two out of three. First match will be a straight wrestling match. The second match will be a street fight, and then the third match, if needed, which will if be needed, needed. <laughs> will be a cage match with Austin and, and, and Triple H plus Rock and Kurt Angle. Uh, of course, the Edge, Christian, Dudleys, and um, uh, Undertaker and Kane three way, and also they have added Stephanie McMahon against Trish Stratus, which hopefully will be a very short match. I know this would never happen. I just don't see Hunter taking uh, two straight matches. But what if Hunter, like, won the first match, and then he won the second match by, like, a total screw job, and then Austin just demanded, you know, hey, I've already lost, let's just do this cage match anyway, and then just totally squashed him? That's not how I would do it. I mean, Austin would get his big win, everyone would be happy, but he would have lost. And Hunter could say, I got two straight wins over you. I think... I think that this is. They're probably going to split them. Oh, of course they're going to split them. Yeah. I say, uh. Okay, I think Helmsley should win the first, the wrestling match. Okay? Austin then, of course, has to win the street fight. Mm hmm. The third one, you know, they could really, it really doesn't matter who would win the third one based on for the future because they could have Austin win on a fluke so he, he gets his hand raised going into WrestleMania. Okay, which probably is the way to do it. And then Hunter can just go, but in the wrestling match, I beat you. I mean, Hunter wins that wrestling match with a pedigree in the middle, and then Austin wins the street fight with a stunner, and then the third one, there's a fluke, but Austin gets his hand raised. Or Hunter can get his hand raised with a total fluke, where Rock costs Austin the match somehow when he's trying to help Austin. They Austin would get his ways. hand raised in the third one, too, so he would win the uh, series? Um, oh, no, it could go either way. I think that who gets their hand raised, you could, you could do it where Austin wins on a fluke. The third one should be a fluke. As long as Hunter... They're kind of going to kill the cage if they have a fluke, though. They're going to... I think that they I think that they don't help their gimmicks anyway by doing three of them and by doing three matches in one night. The other thing I think was dangerous about this one is that they want Austin and Helmsley to carry the summer. And that's why... And, and the, the problem with that is, is once you've seen them wrestle three times on one pay-per-view... With three gimmicks? With three gimmicks, including the cage, what are you going to do? You know, have a hell in the cell again? You know, yeah. for the for the summer papers. That's why I think it's sort of, you know, doing all of them in one night. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it that way. But it does leave you booking outs in that Helmsley can win that first wrestling match, and then it really doesn't matter what you do in the other two because he's got his thing saying I beat you clean in a wrestling match. I mean, Austin can actually win the whole thing, but the key is is the re- when when they come back. If Austin's the champion, they come back after WrestleMania. The match they're going to wrestle is a wrestling match. Okay, yeah. and they can say. They had a wrestling match. Both guys were fresh, and Hunter pedigreed and pinned them. That's not to say that's how they'll do it, but it's a way to do it. Yeah. Okay, so that's some theories on, on that thing. Okay, so anyway, they opened with Kane beating Edge. Uh, and uh, what was that? Yeah, just a clothesline off the top ropes, I believe. And uh, they were supposed to do a table break, which didn't happen. And then, let's see, they had uh, Matt Hardy beat Perry Saturn. Uh, this was a night of a lot of screw jobs. Um that, that actually was a, a clean win. And then afterwards, Dean Malenko came down and kisses Lita. 
And anyway, they set up a match Monday night at, at uh, Raw with Lita against Dean Malenko. And uh-oh, uh-oh is right. Uh, then it's uh, Steve Austin against Chris Benoit, and Steve Austin wins that one with a stunner. When um, Triple H distracts the ref, throws in a chair for Benoit. Benoit gets the chair, but before he can hit it, he gets stunned. But they do give Benoit some stuff at the end, so they don't just squash him and leave him for dead. Jericho and X-Pac has a very weird finish because X-Pac hits his finisher, the X-Factor. and then That's he weird. Out. What? That's weird. Yeah, because it's a heel. Like I, know you, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But so anyway, Eddie Guerrero does a run-in to save the title for Chris Jericho. And then uh, Justin Credible does a run-in, and it uh, ends up with Eddie Guerrero and, X- and uh, Chris Jericho working together and uh, eliminating X-Pac and Justin. But then uh, Eddie Guerrero, uh, actually Eddie Guerrero is lied down, is, is, is lied out somewhere. And then Jericho hits Eddie Guerrero with a chair when it's all said and done. Then we got the beginning of, uh, that's actually the first, that was actually the first of the screw jobs. And then we got oh, a bunch more. Big Show and Raven for the hardcore title. And a hardcore title match ends in a no contest when <laughs> the whole world interferes and Raven just escapes. And, and, uh, Raven sells, or actually Big Show sells absolutely nothing for Raven the entire match. Then we got, um, the last screw job, which is, uh, Rock and Triple H. And there's a referee bump. Let's see, angles out. Triple H goes for a pin after a pedigree, but there's no ref. Then Chris Benoit comes in and puts Austin in the cross face. And then Kurt Angle puts Rock in an ankle lock. And the referee rules the match a no contest. So the um, the show, I guess, ends with uh, Rock and Austin both laid out by Angle and Benoit, which I guess would probably set up Rock and Austin as a tag team Monday on Raw against Angle and Benoit. Of course, after the cameras went off, uh, Angle and Benoit didn't do so well. <laughs> hey, then they can do Monday... It would be um, Rock's, let's see, what would it be? Austin screwing up and causing Angle to pin Rock. So Angle pins him right before having to do the job doing the pay-per-view. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. That makes that makes sense. And you set up WrestleMania. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 good. Yeah. Poll question for Monday Night's Wrestling. Uh, what show did you think was better? Raw, 49%. Nitro, 14%, which actually I thought was... A little bit closer than I expected it. Not that that's very close. I just thought Nitro wasn't really all that good, except for the one match. Didn't watch Raw, 2%. Didn't watch Nitro, 25%. Didn't watch Raw or Nitro, 10%. We have a totally goofy question up today. Let me see if I can find it. Um, It has to do with... If there was a tournament, and uh, all the world champions were in it. I got four world champions. Uh, let me see how it's worded. Okay. <laughs> All of the world champions were in a tournament, and it was real. Like, no scripted finishes. Uh, under pride rules. Okay, so these are the rules. Not amateur wrestling rules, pride rules. Who do you think would wind up winning the tournament? A, Kurt Angle. B, Scott Steiner. C, Kinsuke Sasaki. D, Mark Coleman. Or E, whoever was the luckiest on that given day. So, uh, hmm. just an interesting little look at that one. Uh, let me see. Molson signed a sponsorship deal with WWF today. And uh, what else? They will be offering. Uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, they're going to be doing some stuff there. Uh, let's see. The final XFL numbers were 4.58 on NBC, 2.09 on UPN, and 1.87 nationally on TNN, which is actually 2.40 cable rating. Any other news to get to? If they hired Tony Schiavone, he could come up with a 10 for that. Uh, Linda McMahon could, too. A 10 total. I thought he was going to hire that uh, Faber guy about halfway through that interview. Oh, really? The way he was putting over uh, WWF in every possible way with his, uh, I guess, just not knowing what he was talking about. Yeah. We got to talk about uh, Tajiri and Lynn. Yeah, Tajiri and Lynn both have signed contracts and have sent them to the office. I think the office actually has not signed the contracts, but obviously that's a formality, so... Basically, they're both in. They're both in the three-year deals. So uh, crazy, still up in the air. There is interest in WWF. There is interest in WCW, but there's not a lot of interest as far as money being offered from either side. Mm-hmm. So he he may end up uh, you know wrestling in Mexico and Puerto Rico for a while until until somebody has more interest in him. And uh, who else? Kid, Kid Cash haven't heard anything new. Paul Heyman, there is nothing new to hear. And uh, that's I think that's largely it on. On that account, any other news? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to start hitting some emails. 
Uh, this is from Aaron Steinke, who says, uh, maybe Vince should consider having the XFL on a different night. I'm a teenager, which seems to be the target audience. Well, it was. It's not anymore. Just like any other teenager, I go out on Friday and Saturday, and I don't get home till midnight or 1 a.m. at the earliest. Did Vince consider that at all? I, I believe he probably, in NBC, probably did consider that, but they probably thought that uh, Vince McMahon has the Midas touch, and he can keep teenagers at home, or at least enough of them, and he did the first week. Uh, and, uh, okay, this is, I just wondered how St Stone Cold Steve Austin came to use the move called the Luthez Press. I don't know, he just started doing it. How he and came he, to use it? <laughs> how, he, how he came to use it. Started using it. Uh, it's from Jim Krause, who goes, growing up in Detroit and following the local promotion, uh, the Sheik was the man. He was hated by everyone. He drew big crowds with the Funks, Dusty Rhodes, etc. Actually, as I recall, by the time the Funks and Dusty came, the Sheik wasn't drawing very big crowds. The Sheik drew big crowds, uh, really big crowds, like with Bobo Brazil and Pampero Firpo and Dick the Bruiser and, um, God, who else were the top guys in, uh, Detroit in the late 60s. His big run was really 65 to 70 three or so. After that, his drawing power faded because it was just too much of the same thing. Anyway, uh, what is his place in the history of wrestling nationally and worldwide? Uh, he's absolutely a legendary character from that era, no doubt about it. One of the one of the great heels of all time. Uh, did he draw in other markets? Uh, yes. She pretty much drew everywhere he went. Uh, I'm really curious about his standing in the business because here he was a legend. I mean, he, he was more famous in Detroit because he was the man in Detroit, but he traveled everywhere. It was one of those weird things. It's 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 just so different then than now. But I mean, the Sheik. I mean, he could come to San Francisco, you know, and he probably came like once every five years. But when he came, like everybody knew who he was, and there's no reason they should have because aside from wrestling magazines, which didn't really have large circulations, there's no way that people would know. But somehow they did anyway. I <laughs> I can't exactly explain it. Um, do you think it was really that they all knew, or do you think that it was just kind of? Enough, no, you know what, enough hardcores knew that the word got around. You know what else? I, I think that at the buildings and stuff, what it is 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 that if you knew how to get over in that era, you could get over in the building. Because I mean, I yeah. remember, I remember guys walking to the ring. You know, like uh, the Funks, just an example, the Cow Palace, who never worked the area, and they would walk to the ring, and there really was, you know, there was that kind of that buzz, like, oh, you know, we kind of know that name, but we really don't know if he's a heel or a babyface. We really don't know. But three to five minutes into the match, the place would be going unglued because they actually knew you know, they knew how to work a crowd, and the crowd responded just to the good work. Yeah. And I think the Sheik was like that because he came in, there was blood in the first minute, and people just went crazy, you know, because he did the pencil and all that. He did a lot of stuff that nobody else did, the fighting outside the ring. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it was something new to, to the markets. I mean, here, I mean, God, the Sheik, the Sheik did something in San Francisco in 62, I'm thinking, and... I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't even watching wrestling until ten, till almost ten years later, eight years later, and I would go to the, to the matches, and people would bring up this angle that the Sheik did, you know, eight years earlier. I mean, everybody, like, do you remember when the Sheik, you know, like, uh, chased? The, there was a sponsor, I think it was Jim Wesson or some name. Some old San Francisco fan can correct me on this. When the Sheik chased Jim Wesson up a pole or something like that, you know, uh, the sponsor and bashed in the cars that they had at the at the studio. I don't even remember the, but, but, and people go, do you remember, you know, it's like, it's something that people, like, think everyone saw, because the ratings were through the roof, but it's like, you know, I was, like, two years old. How, how could I have ever seen that? Well, I mean, <laughs> but, I'm just uh, talking about, like, the buzz. Like, remember when uh, they did the Royal Rumble and Taz was going to debut? And there were, like, these Taz chants when Kurt Angle just came out, and it was like, you can't tell me that 18,000 people or however many people were there all had been reading the Internet that afternoon and knew that he was going to be there. You yeah, know, right. be an example of a whole bunch of people knew, maybe uh, maybe to five percent, and the word just kind of spread. You know, it's interesting because somebody um, was talking to me about like Sandman worked this weekend in Puerto Rico. He worked Saturday and Sunday. Uh, Saturday was in Bayamón, and Sunday was in some place somewhere else. And in Puerto Rico, generally speaking, I mean, nobody should know him. Yeah. And and what happened the first night? The story was explained to me the first night. Probably a third of the fans kind of knew the name, and maybe you know fifteen twenty percent kind of knew to chant ECW, right? Mm -hmm. But since it was the main event on the show, he was teaming with Savio Vega, who's the number one babyface. The people, the, the rest of the people who had no idea who he was, just got into it because it's the main event, and there's this guy who's you know looks kind of different. Now they said the next night, when literally they went to uh, whatever city they went to, where literally nobody knew who he was because the 
20%, there wasn't that 20% to to react like this guy's something important. Yeah. Nobody cared who he was at all. Huh. Uh, that's kind of how I was explained, because I was going like, you know, how did because I asked someone who was down there, like, how'd they react to Sandman? And it was like, it's weird, because most of the fans didn't know who he was, the fr but but enough of them did in, in the San Juan area to where it they started could as like... everyone else. Well, it's like, Jer remember Jericho the first time? Jericho was on WWF? It was like, it really was only 20 to 35% of the building knew who he was, and they were going crazy, and we were talking about how... That 35% would eventually influence everyone else because they're making so much noise that everyone thinks he must be important. Yeah. And the next night when they didn't have that 20% or 30% or whatever it is, there was no one thinking he's important, so nobody cared who he was. Mm -hmm. So this is from the Women of Wrestling website. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is actually the reasons for that, that TV taping postponement. They're very clever reasons, uh, and it was not a bomb threat. Uh, the reasons behind the postponement stem from the hectic pre-pay-per-view schedule taking its toll on the ladies. Prior to the pay-per-view, tapings were done at the pace of one per month. Oh, my which God. Which is a hectic pace. In addition, the postponed taping would have occurred only two weeks after the pay-per-view, which is far too soon. And it is a long weekend in the States, so it should be an opportunity for the wrestlers to visit their families and their loved ones. So that's the reason. It's a long it's weekend. A, it's a long weekend. That's a holiday weekend. Oh, okay. People. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I understand that NBC was upset about Saturday Night Live being delayed by the XFL, but consider that Jim Ross plugged an episode of Friends running directly against SmackDown. Maybe NBC should remember respect is a two-way street. <laughs> hey, you know, that's the promos. You know what I mean? I'm sure Jim Ross didn't, like, want to plug. Hey, by the way, they're doing a supersized episode of Friends on Thursday. <laughs> Thursday from 8 to 9, so don't miss it. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's see. This is an interesting letter from Eric. He goes, I listened with great interest to the show where you interviewed Julian Shabazz. Although you didn't go into a lot of depth about it, there was some discussion about the racial discrimination lawsuit against WCW. I believe Shabazz said that it would be WCW's best interest to settle. Did he mean they should settle to make it go away, or they should settle to admit they actually did discriminate? Although I'm sure that some minority wrestlers, particularly some Mexican and Japanese wrestlers, have been victims of the closed-minded mentality of guys like Vince Russo when it comes to being pushed, the discrimination thing is overblown. Can people really say in all seriousness that Hard Body Harrison and Bobby Walker were not pushed because they were black? Are these two men truly that talented that if they were white, they would have been pushed? I don't think any rational, thinking, knowledgeable wrestling fan, black or white, could answer yes to that question. I'm not making light of instances of discrimination and racism, it just seems that many minorities, not just in wrestling, are of a mindset that any time something doesn't go in their way, it's because of racism. We all know that's not the case. There could be an infinite number of reasons why circumstances play themselves out the way they do, none of which have to do with the race. Unfortunately, whenever someone cries racism and discrimination, the onus falls on the alleged perpetrator of said discrimination to prove otherwise. I'm sorry if this sounds harsh, but minorities have a built-in culprit, racism, on which to blame everything that doesn't go their way. For example, a white wrestler with talent who isn't pushed can't claim he was held back because of racism. But a black wrestler with little or no talent can. Take Blitzkrieg, for example. Here's a guy with tremendous talent who didn't receive anywhere near the push he deserved. If he were a minority, he could claim he was being discriminated against because of his race and possibly uh, benefit monetarily if WCW would settle the suit. Yeah, his problem was not that he was Mexican, but he wrestled Mexican yeah, style. Yeah, he was portrayed as one. <laughs> yeah, they, they portrayed him as a Mexican, even though he wasn't. I mean, the whole thing with this this uh, case is they've got Vince Russo making his statement. I'm an American. I want to watch Americans. That was a what very, an idiot. That was a, such a silly statement to make. Now, but the point is, he made that statement before he got the job. And when he got the job, he sort of tried to temper it a little bit, although he didn't really know how to. Because, you know, he pushed Hoovy because Hoovy made him laugh. But he didn't really push Hoovy. Yeah. You know, you know, he gave him that, okay. I think it's safe to say that Blitzkrieg, that Blitzkrieg is much more deserving of a push than Hard Body Harrison or Bobby Walker, uh, but because he's white, he cannot claim he was discriminated against. I mean, he's discriminated against for style. So obviously, and small, uh, so obviously simply being a minority is not the reason for wrestlers not being pushed. I hate to say it, but this lawsuit borders on extortion. It'll be easier for WCW to simply settle it and make it go away than to fight it out, which the plaintiffs are banking on, even though the merits of the case are weak. We're getting to the point where if someone who is a minority feels that he or she is not being pushed, or promoted outside of wrestling, they can always fall back on it. It's because of racism excuse, and in most cases, companies they work for have to give in with their demands or risk being labeled as racist and sad because it lessens the importance of cases where racism truly is a factor and needs to be addressed. Uh, this is from Mike, who says, 
<laughs> Everyone wants an excuse on this one. You'll like this. Regarding the Big Show's weight, I think it may have to do uh, as why he looked fatter. I re rented the Survivor DVD, and the winner, Richard Hatch, lost all kinds of weight from the first show to the last, but he looked fatter at the end. In one scene, he pitched his gut to show the loose skin that losing the weight had given him. Because he lost muscle. Why. Yeah. That's my theory on Big Show. Okay, this is what... But he's enormous. How much muscle could he lose? Did you see how big that guy is? That's true, but I think that's why he looks more jiggly. Oh, it could mean it could mean he loses. He could be more flabby, but but he doesn't look smaller. I mean, like you could have like looser skin, but you would but you would be smaller with looser skin. You know, when you drop a lot of weight, you would be true. larger with looser skin, unless you unless you were like carrying like you know. But how much have they said that he's lost? Like forty pounds or what? Sixty-six. Sixty-six. Okay, he could have lost like forty pounds of muscle. He wouldn't be that much smaller. He's four hundred and fourteen pounds. <laughs> but he, he would be way smaller if, if you lost forty pounds of muscle. You'd be Brian. If you lost, okay, okay, you're a smaller guy than the Big Show. But if you lost, think about this, okay? Big Show's four fifty. Okay, so he's two and a half times your size. If you lost, okay, you lost forty pounds. So let's say you lost fifteen pounds of muscle. You know, right now in the next six weeks. And you walked into the room, would people go, Brian? You know what? You look bigger. They may. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> okay, you could say if you dieted perfectly and you lost 15 pounds of fat, people may ask. Then they you would. Because, but then I, there'd I, be an illusion right. if you're I just bigger when you're small. But I would look smaller and fatter. That's right. Okay, so that's my point. Okay. Okay. We got honky tonk man. We got honky tonk man on the line. We're gonna get to him. Uh, Honky Tonk Man, how you doing today? Very good. I can barely hear you. You're going to have to turn it up. Okay, Al, crank this thing up. We're going to have a good show today. Okay. Um, I guess first thing we should talk about is, uh, I don't know, well, I guess we'll, we'll start with um, your career. You know, a lot of people know you from, the, from your heyday in the World Wrestling Federation in the late 80s. But you wrestled for many years, Memphis, Calgary, Alabama, headliner in a lot of those territories. What, what, before you went to WWF, um, what were some of the places that you went to? Uh, the ones you said, I, I was in Nashville, Memphis, uh, Pensacola, Atlanta, Tampa Territory, and uh, yeah, that was about it. Then I went to Calgary, twice in Calgary. I didn't get enough the first time. I was glutton for punishment, I guess. <laughs> were, were, did, did, were, were any of those territories uh, more like uh, that you liked them more or hated them more than any of the other ones? Uh, no, they were basically all the same. I didn't particularly care about Tampa because we weren't being used good on the card underneath and the trips are quite long when you drove from Tampa uh, to Miami and then uh, maybe up north to Tallahassee. The trips are quite long and I, I just never really cared about that. Now, Calgary, you were pushed, you were pushed pretty heavily in Calgary. Um... Any, did you did you like it there? Or was the weather harsh for you coming from from the states? Or once again, the trips were very hard. Yeah, the weather was harsh. Uh, it was a reality check. I left the beaches of Pensacola, Florida, uh, just prior to Christmas that that year, and uh, you know I, the, the heaviest clothes I had was uh, sweatshirt and sweatpants, and I got to Calgary. It was thirty five below zero three days later. Brother, I'll tell you, I didn't know what I was in for. Now, how was how was working there? That was an interesting time in the business because they had a lot of guys that ended up being big stars elsewhere, like Dynamite Kid, um, and uh, it was it was just, it was it was just an interesting collection of uh, talent there. I mean, how did you like your two trips there? Uh, I, I, I was fortunately the first time I was there myself and Dr. D. David Schultz and the Cuban Assassin and, and, and a boy I went to actually went to high school and junior high with Mike Miller, me and Mike Miller from Portland. We were all traveling in the car together, and sometimes this uh, guy Kerry Brown. And we didn't ride in the van, the 13 guys in the van pull the ring behind it. But uh, uh, the second time I was there, I did the van deal or the, the bus. They, they had one time a 1950 uh, bus that broke down every day. But uh, it wasn't too bad. In the summer times, it was good. We only had three, four days a week we wrestled. Uh, in the winters, when we wrestled the most, and uh, we drew big crowds. And Stu Hart was a great guy to work for, uh, probably one of the most honest guys I ever worked for. Now, how did you first get discovered? Was, was Hogan instrumental in bringing you into WWF? Or was uh, it yeah, be, they had a show in Calgary. What happened, uh, Vince had gone through and taken Dynamite, Davey, Brett, and Jim the first run through there the first year George Scott had, and uh, uh, as he had done all across America, and, and I was still there. Uh, David Schultz had left. David had left and went to Minneapolis the year prior to that. And David and Hogan and the, those guys, Bobby Heenan and those guys, all went over to to uh, WWF that year. Then Vince decided to go nationwide, and 
and came and got Dynamite Davey Brett and Jim. And I was in the second wave of guys, but we happened to have a show in Calgary at the Stampede, the big uh, uh, rodeo thing that year, and they had Hogan come in and, and all the guys. It was a WWF show, and I was fortunate enough, Stu got me on the card for the WWF, and I uh, happened to talk to Hogan. He asked me what i like to come in there, and I said, sure. You know, I see these guys on the independent circuit all the time, and, and they say, well, I can't wait. I can't wait to get a, get picked up by one of the big companies. Uh, how long have you been in the business? I asked him. Well, six months, eight months, a year. Brother, it took me 12 years. And when I told Hogan, Hogan said, how come I hadn't called to come there before? I said, I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think I was ready, even after 12 years. You know, I read something. I'm not sure where. I'm not, that, 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 you know, you work independence, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 dates a year, independence all over the country. And you said that in your, based on what you've seen, uh, there are very few, if any, guys running around independence that you think are ready for the big two. Is that right? This past year, I didn't see any. The, the year prior to that, year before, I saw I saw the one guy that I thought really does, and and he does have potential, is this uh, Rico Constantino or Tello. Rico from, Constantino, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's, from, he's from Las Vegas. I met him through Billy Anderson's guys out in out around L.A. and San Bernardino, and he, this guy looks he, he he looks like a young Ricky Martel. Uh, he did his Power Team USA stuff where. You know, he's got great body, he works very good, but he ended up going over to getting on the WWF uh, developmental thing in Ohio Valley, and I don't know what's really happened to him since. I wish he would have contacted me because at that time Bischoff was looking for talent, and maybe I could have pitched him not to Bischoff, but at least to Jimmy Hart. Mm-hmm. Have you gotten more uh, calls for independent booking since showing up at the Rumble? Uh, well, you get calls from people you hadn't heard of heard from or hadn't heard of at all. Some of the guys I hadn't heard from in a couple of years, they called me. Uh, some people I'd never heard of at all started to call. Uh, yeah, that helps get the phone to ring, but, you know, there's only a few of us that do this independent thing, and to do, you know, when you tell somebody you do 120, 140 shows a year, they don't really think that that's that, that much independent going on, but there there really is that much independent going on. Mm-hmm. If, if you've got a name and you're really, you have to have a lot of contacts, and it's, I mean, it's got to be really hard because you're, you're, you're booking all of your shows, you know, yourself. You know, it's, it's, instead of someone just giving you a schedule and go, you've got to be here, here, and here, and you got to deal with guys of various level of scruples, you know, from people who probably are very honest to people who are absolutely the most dishonest people around. Well, most, yeah, those, most of those guys over the years now have been have been weaned out of the business. They're not around anymore. There's still, they're still a couple of them, but not very many. You know, uh, most of them are dead or, or in jail that... that did all that unscrupulous activity, or they're they're just not around anymore. You know the Tommy D's from New York, and uh, uh, what was that squirrel's name from California that tried to? He was going to put Vince out of business and blew himself away with Herb, cocaine. Herb Abrams. Herb Abrams. He still owes me money. I'll never collect that one. But uh, <laughs> you know, we we normally we got rid of those people. We start charging deposits. I make people send me, you know, either half the money or a plane ticket. Uh, before I guarantee the date to them, and that you know it really constitutes a contract. Plus, it uh, it, it makes them they're committed on their end. Otherwise, uh, they have they don't mind canceling. But uh, with only a few of us that do this, they have to treat us pretty good. So, out of 120 dates a year, how many do you think you have a problem with? Uh, last year, none. I didn't have any problems at all. Knock on wood. The year before, I really didn't have any. Uh, sometimes you get a cancellation. I had one kid, uh, Carmine Despirio. He, call, he, he calls me a couple of years ago. Uh, he sent me a deposit. The show got canceled. He calls me back. He says, Wayne, I want to rebook this show, uh, for another date. To, uh, can you use the same deposit? I said, oh, please, Carmine. It doesn't work that way. I'm keeping that money. <laughs> <laughs> Special guest today, the Honky Tonk Man. Uh, long, one of the longest reigning WBF Intercontinental Champions. Uh, maybe the longest. I'm not sure. Uh, do, you, do you know where we're the longest? Uh, yeah, so far it's 15 months has probably been the record. I don't see that being uh, broken anytime soon. Uh, Ever. Uh, no, I don't think so either. <laughs> 15 days is a long time now. I know. No one has the patience. One of the one of the um, things, when you first came to the WBF coming out of Calgary, uh, got a pretty big push on television as a baby face. In fact, you were booked as Hogan's tag team partner in a lot of cities, and immediately the people didn't like you. They went with a heel turn, which turned out to be very, very successful. Any Any thoughts like... When you first went out there, and after that babyface push, and they started booing, were you happy, or could you, or did you think that, that going as a babyface wasn't the right move anyway? Or well, I, you... I knew, and and, and uh, Vince and myself had talked about it prior to me starting there that, that he wanted to try it because he had he had visions of merchandise, and then uh, you know even now he's he's a merchandising type guy. I'm not going to say what all these other guys say about being a genius, but I think he laughs about 
that when people say that about him. But uh, the merchandising, he, he had that already in his mind, and that's what he thought would happen. And, and I knew it, I just knew that it wasn't going to work because I had tried the thing as a baby face in, in, in Mobile and Pensacola, and it wasn't really a – it's just an, a, a gimmick, the Elvis thing, that, that people didn't want to see. I think if there was a black guy, if there was any – if there was ever a thing that, that some uh, black kid would want to do is come out and maybe try to – emulate to, or, or try to copy and be a, a Martin Luther King type character. And believe me, get heat because no one wants to see some of our heroes duplicated in any way. And, uh, yeah, it was upsetting to go out. You know, I went out, I busted my butt trying to get over. I'd waited 12 years to get to the WWF. I wanted to be there and make some money and do good. And, you know, here these people are just booing me and the, 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 the hills in the locker room didn't want to work with me because I was killing off all their heat. So, you know, the turn came naturally. It came swiftly. And, uh, brother, when I got turned, uh, I never looked back. Now, what was the story? Um, you know, Ricky Steamboat had just beaten Randy Savage for the Intercontinental title in, in that classic match. And then Steamboat and Vince kind of had a little bit of a problem. I guess Steamboat wanted time off. Uh, Vince, I don't know, I guess Vince promised him that and then kind of didn't want to give it to him and Steamboat still had the belt. How did you end up in that position where you beat Steamboat? Once again, I came in on it uh, kind of uh, tail end because they had the, they were going to go with uh, the natural Butch Reed. And Butch was uh, AWOL at the time or, or missing in action, had been gone for two or three days and no one could find him and they thought he would be there at that TV and he was going to get that belt. I just happened to be walking by, all decked out in one of the flashy Elvis suits. Uh, Vince really liked that kind of stuff. He still likes the flashy things. Uh, uh, and, and, and Hogan looked at, at me and looked at Vince and said, put the belt on, why don't you put the belt on this guy? And he calls me over and asked me if, if he did that, would I run with it? I said, brother, uh, give me the ball. I'm going as long as I can. Wow. That's pretty interesting. And, and that's how it happened. I mean, it happened just like that. Twenty minutes later, we were in the ring, and uh, ten minutes after that, I was the Intercontinental Champion. Now, during that reign, probably the thing that the story that's been told, you know, a million times is the night of that that Saturday Night Main Event. It was live, and you were supposed to lose to Randy Savage. And uh, what exactly happened there? Well, uh, gosh, that story's been told a lot, but uh, it, it was a case of I was doing really, really good with the Intercontinental Belt. Uh, I was promised this run with Hogan when I first came to the WWF. I never got that particular run. You know, that that's the kind of can make your career. You're talking about $10,000 a day. We were doing nine shows a week. You're talking 100 grand a week, and you get that run for six months. That's pretty good money, boys. But uh, I was doing okay with the Intercontinental Belt. We were sold out in every every arena I went to myself. Everyone wanted to see Savage beat me for the belt, and it was sold out night after night after night. And now they just want to, right in the midst of this, Make Savage Intercontinental Champion. But the belt was promised to Ted DiBiase, and I read an interview where he did admit that, that uh, because I didn't drop the Intercontinental belt, he didn't get to be the WWF World Champion. Instead, he was made the Million Dollar Champion. But I just felt like it, my time hasn't, hadn't come to, to, to lose the belt and lose it that way. And it disturbed me, and I refused to do the job. And, uh, uh, well, you know, I probably paid a price for it later on, I'm sure I did. Now, in, in in the locker room, I mean, this is this is a live TV. They have this script. You're not you're not being cooperative in their mind. I mean, was I mean, what kind of stuff did they do to like try to talk you into it? I mean, I pretty much I, I heard like things were you know everybody's like you know trying to figure out some way to convince you to do it, right? Not really. No, I had I had a conversation with uh, with Vince prior to the show, and and, and it was like a, a week ahead of time, so they had ample notice that that this this particular thing it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and it's like I said, my deal with Vince was a handshake deal. You, you know, if you put me in a position and I draw, pay me. If if I don't, if you put me in that position, and I don't draw, I don't sell any tickets. Then you can fire me. I'll go home. I'll quit. Uh, and so I, I felt like, hey, if I'm drawing, why stop it? Uh, it's like I said, I waited 12 years to get there. I didn't want it cut off after you know a few months. Now, did what he happened? understand that, or did he? Because I just. For some reason, I can't see Vince just listening to this guy go, I'm not going to do your plan, and just going, oh, okay, I understand. Uh, well, they didn't really have a choice because I was splitting. I had already talked to Jim Barnett, and, and uh, I was, uh, I mean, I was headed to WCW with their belt. <laughs> in fact, in fact, there was a, uh, you guys might remember it, uh, I just, one of the few times I was watching Raw was a couple of years ago, I guess maybe last year, a year ago. Vince was doing the program with Steve Austin, and Vince had the world belt, and, and, and I had told Vince this exact same 
thing I told him that uh, if he wanted the belt, I would drop it to two people. Uh, Hogan, because Hogan brought me to the WWF, and, and I would drop it to him if he wanted to put his tights on and rest me because it was his company and his belt. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, if he wanted it, he could come to Memphis and get it to be on the mantle over my fireplace if he thought he could beat me for it. Now, now a couple months later, uh, you ended up losing the belt to Ultimate Warrior in like a minute. What what changed your mind at that point? At that point where you just you had 15 months, it was long enough, or uh, you know? Well, the, the the meeting that I had had with with Vince and Pat uh, Patterson, myself and Jimmy Hart and and, and Savage was not a, a, a really good business meeting for me because they kind of sat on one side of the room and directed all their attention to Savage. Uh, no attention was given to, to me and, or Jimmy Hart. Our input wasn't asked or, or anything. It's like, why are we at this meeting? Uh, uh, and then when just at the end of the meeting, they turned and said to me, and, and after it's all over and Savage drops the elbow on, on Honky Jimmy, you pull Honky out of the ring and then he'll be off camera not to be seen or heard of again. And that's when Vince looked at me and said, but we're going to repackage you. And I just felt like that wasn't the way for a meeting to go. And a few months later, when we sat down and talked about the Ultimate Warrior situation, it was a real business meeting with two businessmen. And, and, and uh, you know, we came to, the, I think, a proper decision. It really catapulted the Warrior. In repackaging, do you, like, want to give you a new gimmick and everything? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, to, to me, I was just, I don't know. I mean, I went totally blank at that point to the to the fact that I didn't want to hear any more of their, I didn't want to hear any more of their bullshit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm gonna put it honest. I, I was ready to get out of there, and I stopped at the corner phone booth. I called my wife. I said, you know, this doesn't look good. Uh, I, I, you know, give me that, give me Jim Barnett's number, and I'd call the Atlanta office. And brother, I was out of there. <laughs> Jimmy Hart begged me. Jimmy begged me, please, 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 please tell Vince, talk to Vince again, please. Don't just up and leave like this. Uh, I was leaving, brother. I was gone. Now, when now, as far as the run in the WWF, how did how did it end up? Uh, you know, you, then you worked with uh, Greg Valentine as a tag team for a while. What what led to you leaving? And um, there was also another time you were in as an announcer. And if, you know, if, I, I'm trying to remember this now. Didn't did you leave as an announcer and that set the stage for Lawler to come in? Uh, no, that that kind of that, uh, I don't know. Uh, myself and Piper, they had Piper doing this, the Superstar Show with Vince, and they brought me over to do it. Uh, they had let Greg Valentine go. When when they put Greg and I together, we were kind of like a tag team in waiting in case the Road Warriors didn't come over to the WWF. And when they had when they got commitment on the Road Warriors, and you know we were left behind the eight ball. I really thought the Rhythm and Blues thing was a, a neat little in, in, entertainment. It could have been very good on the, in the middle of the card. Uh, you know, with Valentine was hair black, we were getting a ton of heat out there in the matches we were having. It, it was good for entertainment value. But we were the, the kind of the tag team in the shadows, and once they got those guys, we were expendable, so he let Greg go and told me I was going to be transferred over to the TV department. And once I got transferred over there doing the commentary, I didn't mind it, but being around Piper, Piper's like Daffy Duck, you can't get a word in edgewise. Uh, and the show moved fairly fast, not like the Raw show does now. And, and of course, the matches were back then. You had the heel go out and squash the, 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 the job boy baby face in three, four minutes. You had to the, the, the baby face star go out and have to go five or six minutes with a terrible job heel. It was hard to comment on that kind of stuff. But when I was over there, uh, my plane tickets, after all the 300 days a year for four years, 1,200 wrestling shows, I never had problems with plane tickets or anything with the WWF. No sooner I get over to the TV department, they only got to book six guys and buy six plane tickets. I didn't have plane tickets. There was no one. I was supposed to have a car to pick me up at Take me to Stanford. I get over there. I don't have any rooms paid for nothing. It was just like somebody said, okay, let's bring him over here. We'll dump some of this garbage on top of him. Maybe he'll leave. And that's what I did. Mm-hmm. Now, what, now, what, now, what happened with Lawler? You, so you were already gone when Lawler came in. Yeah, he didn't come in until after they did a reformat on the, on the Raw show. And uh, I think Gorilla was gone and Bobby Heenan was gone and all those guys were gone. Now, what's you were, you worked for Lawler, and um, you're, you're actually related to him. Yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> when you started and when you started wrestling, uh, did, you, did you start in Nashville or did you start in Memphis working with Lawler? No, I started. I started. Uh, I was in what they call we call them independent now. They were called outlaw territories. I was an outlaw. I, I broke in with uh, Robert Fuller's uh, uncle Herb Welch. Broke myself and Coco Beware in the same time. 
David Schultz had gone in through there the year before and spot Moondog. Uh, I started in, in, in the outlaw territory of southern Missouri, and I was there for over a year uh, before I ever went to Memphis and started working there. So what, what's, as far as with the Lawler, what, uh, what led to, I mean, were you ever, I mean, were you ever close or was it just like a, the, just a cousin thing but you weren't close and, and, or what, and what happened? Yeah, there was never any real closeness, but uh, you, you would think that, that, you know, if you're in the, if you're in the same business and normally the families do take care of each other, he, he definitely didn't. I mean, it even shows with his own sons. Uh, he's not taking care of them. He's, it's too bad for Brian Christopher that he's going to have to suffer the sins of the father. But the, 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 he, the boy's very talented and probably do good if, uh, if the old man was out of there. But uh, he's never going to share the spotlight and let the kid do anything. Uh, when he was booking the Memphis Territory, he would do stuff like tell me, he booked me one night a week, 400 miles one way to Louisville, $40 payoff. I, I would go there and make the show and drive back by myself. You couldn't even team up in the car with him, because I was the only guy going by myself and coming back. Uh, and then I said, "Man, I'm just, you know, it's I, it's hard to make these trips. Why are you complaining? If you buy more, if you buy more outfits, I can book you more, which meant more mask outfits. I'd be myself on the first match, and you know, the masked uh, Marvel on one match, and the Super Destroyer on another <laughs> match, and then go in a tag match. Work four or five times a night." But every time Jerry Jarrett was booking the place and, and running it, I was taken care of. And it was Jerry Jarrett that always pitted me against Lawler in the angles that we did that made money there. Now, uh, in 93, I think it is, it's not the right, the right time, what, what led to you uh, going into WCW with Hogan? And uh, was, was Hogan there? Boy, I'm glad you brought that up because I could spend about the next eight hours talking about Hogan, Bischoff, and that mess they have. <laughs> Let's start. Uh, anyway, a quick history on it. Uh, uh, Hogan was going to, he was going there, and Jimmy Hart and, and didn't want Hogan to go there all alone by himself to try to make some kind of an impact. So they were trying to get a few of us ex-WWF players that, that would go in and, 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 and help Hogan with, you know, really to make an impact on the company. And, uh, uh, you know, I agreed to do that and, and met with Bischoff and the promise of, you know, a contract in, in November when the money gets freed up and all this nonsense. And, and, and I would fly. For, I'd just moved to Phoenix, and I'd fly to, to Atlanta, stay over there two days, fly back to Phoenix, stay home one day. And come November, the contract never came. Come December, they asked me to do the job for Johnny B. Bad, and I just couldn't do it without a contract. So Bischoff said, well, we can't use you. After all that time and effort they put into me, they didn't even bother to say, well, look, what can we do for tonight, just to do this tonight, and then talk tomorrow maybe. They, he just said, well, I can't use you. Just, just, uh, just as we were talking about WCW right before uh, the break, in your opinion, is, is there anything that can be done to salvage WCW? Is it too far gone, or do you have any ideas on what you would do in that situation? Well, you, uh, you know, Dave, Bischoff must be one great salesman to be able to sit down with and I, I talked to Vince about this at the Rumble, to be able to sit down with, with, with some guys and say, listen, i got a heck of a deal for you. You know, uh, this company, they lost about $80 million or $100 million, but we can get it at a bargain, and, 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 and I can run it for you and turn this thing around. When, in fact, he was the guy that lost that 80 or $100 million. And he's got, the, that would be the prime interviews to find out who these goofs are that bought this piece of junk. And, and Vince said he was going to buy it. He was going to buy it and then and, and, uh, wanted to buy it, but only for the time slots, not for the talent, just the time slots that they had. But Time Warner, I mean, uh, Viacom, uh, I guess, canceled the deal because they felt like that he might put more of his stars on that particular cable show than than the one that he was committed to. So they, they're the one that pulled a plug on it. I don't know what he, you know, it's Bischoff says he's going, uh, he's going to bring in new people. What planet is this guy living on? Where is he going to get new people? They said, well, he can get them from ECW. If they wanted the ECW guys, they would have got them six months ago. They didn't take them. Now Vince has took the only three that's left there, and that company, uh, you know, is pretty much gone. And, and I tour this country every weekend. There is no independent talent out there. The guys are either trained in hardcore or they learn lucha style. Now they got to be retrained. No one has costumes. No one has real good gimmicks. I don't know what Bischoff. I, I'm just saying he was the guy. Him and Big Lazy Nash and Hogan and Ric Flair and that bunch. They ruined that company. Flair and them guys. And Dave, I know you like you like Flair, and I see that you, you're probably getting on him a little bit now. It's time for him to move on out of there. Brother, they ruined that thing. This swinging four dead four horsemen killed that place 20 years ago, and it will never be any good. It's done. There's nothing you can do. Where are they going to get guys from? 
You can't take a Billy Kidman having beat Hulk Hogan and make him a star overnight. Vince McMahon, that's the one thing Vince does. I'll give him credit for that. He just he didn't bring Rocky in and all of a sudden Rocky's a star, the main event guy, making a fifteen, twenty million dollars a year. They groomed this kid and brought him along over a period of about two years. Same thing with Stone Cold Steve Austin. I don't know where Bischoff thinks he's gonna get talent, but he did a heck of a sales job to he I mean he picked Turner's pocket and now he's picked these guys' pocket. Well it's really interesting because it's 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 the 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 deal making seems to be his strong suit. In that he got he got the job, you know, and got when he, the one thing that he did in like '95 was he got Turner to spend a lot of money on talent in '95, which led to the only you know successful period they had. The problem is they made long-term commitments to guys that uh, burned out, and then he made a deal here when that company was dying again. Plus, there they, were guys available in '95, and everyone now is under contract. He structured. Yeah. They've structured some of the worst contracts in the history of, of sports business. You can't guarantee somebody, well, I want to be world champion three times. Oh, well, if he's world champion three times, I've got to be world champion four times. You can't do that. You can't have somebody, well, I only work 100 days a year. Well, I only work 90 days a year. But, you know, you got a guy on a major angle, well, he can't work today because it's his, somebody in his family's got, I heard this, somebody in somebody's family has a birthday, so the guy gets off the day before and the day after. I mean, this is like crazy. But then I hear I heard an interview, and I like Bobby Heenan. Bobby's a friend of mine. Bobby does an interview, and he says, oh, the WCW, what was wrong with it? Just not run by wrestling people. Well, who the heck was Flair, Arn Anderson, Terry Taylor, Bischoff, Hogan, Dusty Rhodes, Mike Graham, Greg Gagne, Jim Ross, and Jimmy Cornette ran that company one time? If yeah. these aren't wrestling people, who the hell are they? What's, uh, let's, what, what, let's, go to, let's go to Chris in Long Island for the first caller. Chris, what's going on? Uh, hi, how's it going? Hi. Uh, uh, hi, Hockey. I uh, grew up watching you, and I remember uh, hating you as a kid, so uh, I guess that was a good thing. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I did my job. Yeah, you I definitely it. did. Uh, I couldn't stand you when you beat uh, Steamo for the title at the time, because as a kid, he was one of my favorites. So uh, it's uh, kind of an honor to talk to you. Um, I had one question, uh, a few questions, actually. Recently, I heard you on a few other uh, radio shows about Billy Gunn, how they were calling you a career killer and everything, and you said that he, he didn't want to listen to instruction. Um, basically, like, what was whose choice was it to, to team him with you, and how doesn't he take the advice that's given to him to uh, try and propel his career? You know, what is it that he's so hard to do? What are your thoughts on Billy overall? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I might not be good at anything, but I can at least recognize and know when somebody's talented. And obviously, from the reports I've been reading on the Internet, I don't watch the shows. But Billy's not faring too well as a single wrestler out there. and He's not getting good reviews. I don't think Dave's giving him four stars on any of his matches. So. Not lately. But, uh, <laughs> I, he, he, did, he really kind of a hothead. And he doesn't want to listen to anybody. And why he didn't want to listen to me, I don't know. It wasn't my choice to have him. I wouldn't have had him because him and uh, the Road Dog were trading off opening match jobs for six months before I ever came there. Uh they should have put me with someone new that was coming, some new guy they wanted to bring in. The Brian Christopher would have been good. He was a new kid. If they knew they were going to bring him in or someone else and, and do it that way or bring me back, put me in the ring, let me do the job for the rookie of the year sensation, the Rocky, and, and, and catapult him, something that way. I just, the Billy Gunn, Rockabilly thing, I'm going to tell you, this. I, a lot of people might know it. Savvy Old Vega was the first choice they were going to use. They were going to make him the the, the Puerto Rican Elvis or something. <laughs> oh, really? I never heard that. Serious? I mean, I don't know who. I don't know where that came from. Uh, that it wasn't a Vince Russo thing. I can know that because he was too busy trying to, you know, uh, make sure he got to uh, look at Sable's chest. <laughs> um, was so there ever any talk of bringing Disco Inferno in in that role? <clears throat> no, never was. Okay. Would you have, if you were had your choice to take somebody else, and, and you did take a guy like Brian Christopher, would you have given him the rockabilly gimmick or a gimmick like that, or did you not even like that gimmick at all? Would no, have... I, th I thought it was. I, I didn't. I didn't particularly like the gimmick. It was not. It was not good. It was just not a good gimmick. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I didn't have. To, I didn't spend a lot of time with it. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it because that's something. When when things don't work, I don't worry about why they didn't work right. too much or what I could have done to have changed them because. There was nothing I could do about it. It was just the, the whole thing drug on way too long. It went on for about four months or so, and it was just it was nonsense. Uh, I mean, I got nothing out of it other than people saw me back on TV again, and I don't think the WWF got anything out of it. And um, I've also heard you talk about Jeff Jarrett, how you don't 
basically don't like him, or at least you don't like the fact how he's well, using the guitar. Well, to me, it's a lack of professionalism. Okay. But just because too, too, the gimmick's too, too similar to yours for the guitar. Yeah, I don't see. You know, I don't see anybody going around with a snake around their neck, calling him. You know, calling themselves a snake man, or nobody's blowing a bagpipes and saying that they're, you know, uh, an Irishman from from Ireland or or any of those things. I, I just think Jarrett had Jarrett had tried the gimmick earlier. They brought him in with the WWF to do it. He came behind one of the Armstrong kids, as a singing cowboy or something. They tried to fill my shoes with some Lance Cassidy, the singing cowboy. That was a flop. Oh, then they bring Jared and bring him, make him, make him a, a country music singer with a guitar. It was a flop for him. He goes to WCW. It's unfortunate. Obviously, the kid can't understand how to get over. They stick him with this girl, Deborah. Now, the first thing you do is get rid of the girl. It's, if I had one thing to tell uh, Scott Steiner right now, I'd say, get rid of the girls, brother. You don't need them. Let those people look at you, not the girl with the big chest. So anyway, uh, uh, he's stuck with a girl. His career goes nowhere. He goes back to the WWF, and they put the, he goes back for the guitar gimmick again. Now, all he had to say was, look, take this guitar and shove it, folks. I don't want this thing. It's killing me. Because you just can't copy those. Our, our gimmicks in the, in the 80s, in the late 80s and early 90s were over so strong around the world that anybody who tries to copy them or duplicate them, they're just, they're, might as well forget it, they're dead. And Jared's dead. So is that all that you really have against him, or does it, is it just the fact that he, he won't let go of that That's gimmick? That's all. There's nothing personal. It's all business. I mean, oh, okay. you know, it's a, to me, it's a lack of professionalism and, and professional courtesy. I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go in the locker room. Uh, if he's, you know, if someone's in the WWF or the WCW and they brought me in and, and said, what kind of gimmick would you want? I look around the room and I just picked one and started dressing like Stone Cold or talking or acting like Rocky or, or doing the Chris uh, Jericho thing. You know, that's not good. It's not in good professional taste. What if somebody had at least, like, if Jared had come up or had called you or something and said, look, you know, they want me to do this gimmick, would you mind if I do it? I don't want you to think I'm ripping you off. Would you have then had a better uh, feeling about the fact that he at least had the respect to come to you and say, look, this is what I'm going to do. Do you do you mind? No, I would have told him the same thing. It's, it's you know, don't do it because, you know, it's a death wish, wish for you. Uh, just by looking at the, the, the first kid they had, the singing cowboy gimmick they had prior to that, he should have said, no, it's not going to work. And then when it didn't work for him the first time, that's when you really do can it. I mean, you can it then and you forget about it. Now he does it in WCW. They do it all the time. He's not dressed like any kind of person from the music business. Uh, he does nothing that has anything to do with the music business. And uh, it just you can't insult people's intelligence with you know that nonsense stuff where they hit a guy over the head ten times a night. We did that. I, I, I used a guitar five times on TV in about four years. Yeah, it was actually, it meant something back then. Now it's just, it's like a headlock, you know. It just happens all the time, so nobody cares. Well, that's why it meant something, is you never did it. The whole thing is, is, is like, it, it, you know, it, it's a hard crowd and it's an easy pop. You know, big explosion, things things fall everywhere, so people will pop. But then you start relying on that, and it does. And yeah, it does. And then when you do it every show, it doesn't mean anything. I, I just, I, I really believe that you can tell when someone, and, and for all the young wrestlers out there that might be listening, I tell them this on the independent: you have to find that gimmick or that thing that you can do that you really believe in, that you can look into the camera and you can talk about it, you can sell it to these people, no matter what it is, and you believe in it, and you can do it because, in, in most cases, the gimmick really is the man. I mean, it really is the man, and you have to believe in it. And and you see, I can spot a guy on TV who doesn't believe in his gimmick. I can spot a guy on TV who is not comfortable doing what he does. It has to be like an extension of that person's personality. Really does have to be, yeah. right? You have to be comfortable with that role you're playing. Right. Um, my last question is actually about: uh, did, did you ever get a chance to read the Dynamite Kids book? No, I never did. Uh, I, I wouldn't, and I probably wouldn't because uh, I could care less about his book. Uh, did you do you know of the story that he kind of told about you uh, in the locker room regarding something that had to do with uh, supposedly you had made a comment about Harley Race, some sort of joking comment about a paycheck you had that at the time Harley Race wasn't getting paid, and supposedly you said something about Harley Race who Dynamite is close with, and he claims he like threw you up against the locker and, and scared you and did all of this and, and had you in tears and this and that. I just want to know no, if you no, that that's, story. that's not the case. I was never thrown against a locker by anyone, and uh, he never scared me and. Uh, uh, the comments that were made about Harley Race was made by Bobby Heenan, not by me. It had nothing to do with anything. He was drunk and obnoxious and yelling and screaming, and that's all he did, and I lost total respect for him. 
because uh, I'd been with him in Calgary for three, four years, and WWF for a year, and no, there was, and it was done in the, in in the, in, the, in another locker room where nobody was there but he and I. Okay. So there's his side of the story. There's my side, and probably there's the truth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I appreciate the time, and uh, thanks for uh, taking the call. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks a bunch, Chris. This is an email from T Tony Aragona. He's asking you your opinion on the following wrestlers. Uh, that you worked with, uh, we already talked about Lawler, uh, David Schultz, as actually they're not all wrestlers, uh, one's a promoter, David Schultz, uh, Nick Goulas, Bad News Allen, and Larry Latham. Uh, gosh, I'll start with Nick Goulas. Probably the worst payoff man in the history of the business. <laughs> uh, but everyone knows that. I compared, uh, you know, I even said, <laughs> I called, uh, uh, said something to Vince one time about having to chase Nick Goulas for my money, but I never thought I'd have to chase, and I said, Vince, I didn't think I'd ever have to chase you for it. Because uh, we were having a dispute over money, and I also said something too hard about Nick Goulas one time, and oh gosh, it really raises dandruff uh, <laughs> when you make a comparison to promoters about Nick Goulas. But uh, Nick taught me something that, that 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 has worked out very well for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this on all the young guys and anybody else out there. It really is life itself. Nick paid me twenty dollars. Uh, for a match, I think it was getting like 150 for the week or something, and 100 dollars for the week. And I said, Nick, I, I just can't, I, I can't live on this. How do you expect a guy to live on 20 dollars? He looked at me and he said, Son, it's not what you make, it's what, it's what you, you save. <laughs> so uh, that was that's been my motto all the way through now, and that, and that kept me going even in those dismal days when I had long trips and made no money. David Schultz, uh, we rode together and was together a lot. David was. Very talented, extremely talented. It was his idea for WrestleMania. It was his idea for Mr. T, uh, a Hulkamania. A lot of that came from David Schultz. Great interview guy, very talented. A little bit too much of a hothead on the promoters, a little bit too much of a bully on them. Uh, probably cost him his career. Hogan had a lot to do with it, stabbed him in the back. Larry Latham, a great talent. Uh, Larry, not a talker. He always had to have a manager or a partner with him. But uh, very good in the ring, real southern style wrestling, and could do hardcore. You know, we created hardcore with the Tupelo, Mississippi thing anyway. But uh, Bad News Island, another very talented. And and I, when I mentioned Martin Luther King earlier as somebody who might want to do that gimmick as a black person, if they would have made Bad News like the Martin Luther King black guy, and he was supposed to beat Hogan for the belt. That was a true story, and I read his interview. Uh, he was promised beating Hogan to be the first black champion in the WWF. I think it would have been tremendous. I, I mean, I think he would have had that kind of a heat that Nikolai and uh, Iron Sheik had. A real, real serious uh, sellout business heat. But they didn't do it, and, and it's too bad because uh, Allen's a great guy. You know, this Kieran Shea actually asked about uh, the match in the Tupelo match. A lot of people probably don't remember it. It was uh, about 79. Uh, you and... Um what was it, uh, Larry Latham against, was it Lawler and Dundee? Lawler and Dundee, match? yeah. Yeah. And Danny yeah. Davis was our manager. He's in the Ohio Valley thing now. Yeah, so that that was, uh, I mean, it was the, 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 the famous Tupelo concession stand brawl that they replayed on Memphis television for probably ten straight years. Right, um, and uh, <laughs> that, was, that, that actually created ECW because of Eddie Gilbert as a young boy, as a Mark fan, uh, being there with his dad, Tommy. Tommy Gilbert was on the card, and, and Eddie saw that, and... And when Eddie got into the wrestling business, he eventually met Paul E. And and, and then that's how ECW kind of kind of uh, got started, uh, along with that Joel. Uh, uh, he owes me good a good heart too. Yeah, you know. In fact, another thing that that, that spawned from that is uh, one of the uh, about two years later or so, when Eddie Gilbert started wrestling, Eddie Gilbert and Ricky Morton did a similar brawl. I think it was in Tupelo too, um, with uh, Onita and Masafuchi. And that's where Onita got the idea, and he went to Japan and made a ton of money with the FMW, you know, doing the brawling. Because right, never right. Done... I was in, yeah, I was in Tampa, I think, at the time when those when Onita and Fuji were there in yeah. Memphis. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it, you know, uh, it's not that you know, guy. Look at kids. Look at me. And say, well, honky don't man, you don't take any bumps. You don't do this. Hey, brother, when you've been around for 20 years, you should learn how not to have to take those bumps. You, our thing is manipulation of the crowd for the time that you're out there, and if you can't do that, and you have to do it by flipping off the top rope and having four guys on the floor catch you. And, you know, I always said about the Lucha stuff, when that guy goes up and does a one-and-a-half gainer off the top turnbuckle and I'm supposed to stand there, I mean, what if you just backed up and said, heck, I'm not catching this guy. <laughs> How are you doing injury-wise? Uh, I've been fortunate so far. I mean, King Kong Bundy bruised my ribs on Saturday night over in Pennsylvania, but other than that, uh, 
Gosh, but he's 400 pounds. you got to accept it, I guess. Yeah. How was, uh, how was the deal as far as, uh, I guess it was kind of almost a last-minute thing, you going to the Royal Rumble? Yeah, it came up on a, uh, I was speaking with Jimmy Hart on a Tuesday prior to that. I'd read the Internet on, on Tuesday morning or Monday or something. He said Jimmy Hart was in the hospital. So I got on, I called Jimmy's house to find out what the heck happened to him. We only speak once every two or three months, and we never really talk. We never talk. We never talk about business. He won't. Jimmy never tells me anything about the business anyway. So uh, we talk socially. Uh, but I was had talked to him, and and, and then on uh, I hung up the phone from him on Tuesday afternoon, and then the last thing we said, I said to him, is I said, Jimmy, you just never know when the phone's going to ring again. You know, you're only one shot away from that NFL contract, uh, one motion picture away from the. Uh, your next Oscar award, you just never know. Or, or in his case, I said another hit record. Uh, <laughs> the following I don't day, know the following day about <laughs> noon, uh, Jim Ross called me. It was like on a Wednesday, I think, and asked me would I be interested in working the Rumble. I didn't know where it was. I, I told him that I was had a show, uh, uh, an autograph session in New Orleans for a monster truck guy on a Friday. And he said, "Well, that's where we are. Would you mind staying over?" I said, "No, I'd be glad to." And that's, the, the the question is this. And, and, and Tom Brandy brought this up to me. Oh, I said, I don't know why they call me. I don't know what they call me for. I figured because I was doing all these commentaries on the Internet, and I've, I've had some pretty good little commentaries knocking a few people, that they were bringing me in to punish me, you know, keep you in the ring and the rumble for about 45 minutes or an hour. It's a real punishment. It's nothing to enhance your uh, your drawing power. It's strictly punishment. But they didn't do that. But uh, as Tom said, the question is, who brought your name up? In what meeting, and when did they bring your name up, and why? And that it really is a question: who brought my name up, and I don't know. It really doesn't matter. I never, I never heard, and I was, uh, you know, I was surprised that day when I heard. It was like, uh, you know, where did this come from? <laughs> yeah, and the, you know, it was a good little pop for the crowd, and uh, I, I read internet reports where the crowd didn't know who the honky tonk man was. Well, they must have a short memory. I was just there two years ago. Yeah. I was there for a year and a half, two years ago. That's true. What was your thoughts when you first heard about uh, Vince McMahon starting the XFL? Oh, gosh. Uh, I thought like a lot of people, uh, football, they have the arena thing, they have the World League uh, NFL, when they're going to play it, what time slots, what TV. I think with, I didn't I didn't really think it's going to be such a big, big hit. Uh, there's probably a spot for it on television. Uh, prime time, I don't think so. Uh they were probably dead in the water without Dick Ebersol jumping in bed with them. Uh, and now that he has, uh, it'll keep them alive. But uh, normally Vince will promise something. He delivers on it. But on this one, he hasn't been able to really deliver that that hard-hitting, behind-the-scenes, uh, no-nonsense football. And they really should keep the wrestling out of it. I got, uh, Jim Ross is not a bad commentator for football at all, but uh, he's associated with wrestling. He, he, you know, keep wrestling out of it. Jesse Ventura, you know, Dick Ebersol is probably in those guys are living in the past. Jesse was great doing wrestling when he could do it and not try to be politically correct. Now he's trying to be at least politically correct on the football side. you got to understand, he's a governor of Minnesota. He can't be saying and bashing people. I, I could go there and bash a lot of people. I could bash those players from, from here to, to, to hiatus, but... Jesse can't do that. So they're not getting their bang for the buck out of Jesse. He's got to be politically correct. And so uh, I just haven't seen anything that, that makes this league, uh, makes people want to tune into it other than, you know, the curiosity factor that happened the first week. How long do you think it'll last? Well, as long as they have, as long as the Vincent's got it on TV and as long as he's got a network to carry, it, he, he's going to stay with it, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a question of, the, of NBC, you know. Between yeah, the, that, the, that you know, and that's going to be the the major uh, uh, thing. But then uh, Vince will just he'll put it on another station. Someone else will pick it up because uh, they, you know, all these cable stations need programming. The only thing is though is that the the, the drop from NBC to TNN it, it'll come off just a minor league. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know that's going to it's already happened anyway. Uh, yeah. So that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, it's a matter of uh, of, of not sinking you know, a ton more money into it or just let it ride and see what happens. I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, Vince is racking his brain on it. He don't want to come up a loser on this deal because uh, then it sets a pattern that he can't do anything outside of wrestling, which exactly. doesn't send a good, uh, it's not a good signal to Wall Street. Uh, once again, I, I didn't know who the people were that bought the stock anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean not, not just Wall Street, but, but Vince himself, because I think Vince himself wants to be known as a great, 
promoter rather than just a guy who was a wrestling promoter. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's that's true, and, and he probably can because he's very innovative, and he he does things first class, and he does things the right way, and he surrounds himself with the right people. That's why I said he probably laughs when all his all his stooges and people that work for him, or people who want to work for him, call him a genius. He probably laughs about that. So I'm not gonna go so far as to call him a genius. <laughs> Dave, you're probably the genius of this whole bunch. I mean, it's most ironical. You've probably had more impact on two wrestling companies than anybody in this business. Uh, I mean, you actually had the booking committee, which was uh, Jim Ross and Jim Cornette, and those guys in the WCW was reading the Observer and booking their matches according to what you said. And we were in the WWF, and, of course, you didn't really care so much about the WWF back then. That, that, that the, the Observer was banned from the locker rooms. We had to go into the restrooms or read it in the confines of uh, uh, the back of the building where no one would see us reading it uh, in, in fear that we would be fired or reprimanded because we had the Wrestling Observer and looking at it. So, uh, <laughs> And then, uh, ironically, you showed up on TV sitting beside Vince McMahon at the Donahue Show. <laughs> Didn't Howard right. Finkel get in big trouble one day for reading it? Uh <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. You know, it was never, no one ever told us not to read it, but it was kind of implied. It was like, don't get caught reading that thing. And you, know what they used to do? <laughs> you know what they used to do on the airplanes is, is that they would, like, you know, get a magazine, and they would stick it, like, in, inside the magazine so everybody looked like you were reading, like, Time Magazine or Newsweek. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it, 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 I'm sure it still is, and then at that time it was the most read newsletter in the history of this business. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was the first still one. Still is. Like, <laughs> so you probably had more of an impact. You were you were booking both uh, both companies at one time, whether you knew it or not. I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> they always do the opposite. And somebody used to tell me, he goes, why don't you just play, put in the Observer the dumbest ideas possible, so then when they do the opposite, at least they'll be good ideas. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, I, I, I was, that was something, you know. And, and then again, the, but the business has changed a little bit. Uh, we weren't allowed to read uh, George Napolitano's or Bill After's magazines either. They weren't oh, allowed God. in the locker room, only WWF <laughs> material. And boy, things have really changed. Well, there was Why were the After magazines banned? Uh, they were banned from the building. They couldn't even take pictures of us. If we posed for a picture and it looked like we posed for a picture, you know, it was like there again, it was like getting caught with the Observer. Uh, well, you, you got to remember in the in the eighties, you know, Vince's design was to take over every aspect every of the business, and and one of the first things he targeted was the magazines. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a personal thing, but he just wanted you know all those magazines. When he started his own magazine, it was like he was going to run every magazine out of business, and it didn't quite happen. Um, <laughs> you know, what's funny is is that uh, five years ago, you know, it was kind of like one of those things where you know Vince, you know, at one point he probably controlled eighty ninety percent of the whole business. And then WCW came along and, and, and got strong. And we were kind of thinking, like, you know, no one's ever going to control the whole business. And now here we are, 2001. And it's like, you know, a year from now, he may control the whole business. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, it does make a circle. Uh, fortunately for the magazine people, uh, uh, you know, the Nitro was a, a, a good avenue for them to sit at ringside and be around ringside taking pictures. So WWF was literally forced, I guess, to give press passes to uh, after and uh, and George <laughs> yeah but and then uh, but then when they got when they got the upper hand it's you know they start setting the rules again oh yeah well that's that's normal though I mean uh, I've always said that the WWF is like a dandelion uh, you can chop them down but you give them a little water and sunshine they'll sprout right back up yeah let's go to uh, Henry in Arkansas Henry what's going on hey guys how's it going hey it's going good happy Valentine's Day uh, Hockey Talk Man, uh, first I'd like to say thank you for such an entertaining gimmick and character. I want to know, who is your favorite person to work with? Oh, gosh, there were so many. I get asked that a lot. Uh, you know, Jake was good, uh, uh, very good. Jimmy Snooker was very good. Ricky Steamboat I probably had the best matches with. But if Ricky would have came back and gave me some return matches when I was WW, when I was Intercontinental Champion, uh, probably would have been better for me and probably for the whole comp for everyone involved. Uh, I had good matches with Savage. It wasn't great, uh, personally being around him. I didn't think he, I think he's been, uh, overrated as, as the worker that a lot of people say he is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very repetitious, kind of like, I don't want to say this day, but he's very much like Ric Flair and Bret Hart. He's very repetitious, does the same thing in every match. But, uh, I, I got the most out of matches with Snooker, Steamboat, and, uh, and Jake Roberts, but there's been tons of guys I've worked with through the years that just phenomenal, phenomenal guys in the ring that, that never achieved, uh, you know, the level of success they probably should have. What are your thoughts on Hogan nowadays? Ah, <laughs> 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 I'll tell you this. 
someday, somewhere, I'll see him again. Someday, somewhere, I will see Hogan, and I'm going to call him out. It's just that simple. I really am. Really? What, and what, what, I, what and I almost feel the same way about Bischoff. Bischoff lives here in Phoenix. Phoenix is not a real big city, and I'm going to run across him someday, too. What, what's, what's, what, what, um, as far as Hogan, what's the heat there? I just felt like that I went to the WW, uh, WCW to help Hogan, and I told this to him, that I came here for you. I didn't come here for these guys. Uh, you know, I didn't come for Ric Flair or Arn Anderson, any of those guys. I came for you, uh, and I said, it looks like there's no plans for me, and, 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 you know, what's your role in this? And all he said was, I'm only here to serve there's, there's nothing else I can do. He said, a, man, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. I mm. said, you're right, and you're not the man. Yeah. And he was in a position to say, look, Eric, you promised the guy a contract, or, you know, you know, this guy's a friend of mine, or whatever the case might be. That's the thing. To me, this is the thing that, that has hurt Hogan all the way through, and it's really hurt him now in his last... In his last years of the business, I say the last. I say his last years because verse. I think he's finished. Uh, he's got one foot in the grave. He's as close to a dead man as you can be. He didn't surround himself. Now I've got to give Ric Flair this. Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes and 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 all the guys that were bookers, Dave, and you know this. The bookers always had a clique or a little yeah. group around them, and wherever they went, they carried their friends with them, and they kept those friends together. Rick still, Rick Flair still has all of his friends together with him in WCW. That makes him a force to have to be dealt with. Dusty always had his group of guys around him. Hogan never had that. Hogan only had Beefcake. That was it. And so when power struggles come along, things like the Kidman deal and, and, and Hogan not getting the promotion he thought he deserved from, from Russo and those guys, that would never have happened if he'd had five, six of his guys there and, and all in top-slotted positions. He would have been in a, in a position to hold power. So he never did that. And, and consequently, believe me, out here on the independent circuit with the four or five or six, eight guys that we have out here, there's no loyalty to Hogan. None of us. So I hear these stories about, yeah, Hogan's going to start another wrestling company. Where's he going to get talent? You think I'd work for him? Brother, he'd have to send me one hellacious signing bonus, and then I wouldn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another question, Hockey. Uh, I was wondering, uh, when can we expect to see you in the uh, Northeast Arkansas, Memphis area again? Because I'd love to see you work in person. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, if, if I ever get by, I still have some family and, and, and people over around that area, but they, they can't afford to fly me there. Uh, I've not been over that way to, to call them up and say, hey, I'm going to be in town and, and, and work for those guys over there. Uh, there's just no independent guys that that... that that run that run and can afford to bring guys in and and so I wouldn't say in the near future I don't have anything planned on my books between now and May so don't look for it before then. And I have one last question. Um, I heard you guys talking about him earlier. I was just wondering uh, where is Tom Brandy right now? Uh, Tom does his normal independence. He does his 60, 80, 100 shows a year. Oh my God! He does the Salvatore Sincere gimmick, which was I thought was a great little gimmick uh, with the Italian thing that he did. Mm. And uh, I since put the, uh, uh, helped him do a Patriot thing where he does the Patriot thing out in these towns, and it's worked out really good because we do a lot of military bases. In fact, I'm leaving next Saturday to go to the South Pacific for a month and wow. just do Whoa. military bases. Wow! Yeah. Well, for what, what, com- what company is that for? It, it, it's not a company. It's through the uh, it's through the USO. Oh, okay. So is Tom myself, Shea still running? I, I got Billy Anderson hooked up on it. Billy out of California, San Bernardino, where he trains wrestlers. He's taking some guys in uh, Malaya, Osaka, uh, some other girl, myself, one man gang, and uh, uh, what's uh, Big Sam? Uh, all I know him is Big Sam, the original head shrinker. Oh, oh Sam, Sam, Sam in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, Big Sam's going. So we got a good crew going, and it's going to be fun. Okay, anything else, Henry? Uh, no, I, I love your show. Listen to it every day, and um, keep up the good work, guys. Okay, let's go to Charles in Pittsburgh. Well, let's, let's go to a break first, then we'll get come back with Charles. Okay, we're going to go to Charles. Okay, well, let's go to Charles. Okay, Charles, what's up? Hey, uh, Dave, what's going on? What's hey, up? Honky, I just had a question for you. Um, okay. I, I read a report where uh, that where you uh, did the Between the Ropes uh, radio, and I just wanted to uh, get your... Uh, comment on the cruiserweights because I like heard that you uh didn't feel that like 
the short guys could like really draw money or anything. I just wanted to get your comments on that. Well, yeah, you know, I picked up a little heat about that, and I want to say this to all the guys out there that's under six foot tall. I didn't mean it to be a knock on you or a knock on anybody that, that that's in the cruiserweight division. It's a good part of having them on the card. Believe me, it's a good part of having those guys on the card to fill in the slots. And the card should be made up of a multitude of people. I mean, sheiks, freaks, and geeks, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and, and be very entertaining. I'm from the entertainment side of this business. I, I'm not. I'm not a technical wrestler, but history has shown that it. Wrestling is a is like a supernatural hero type thing. We're bigger than life, and average size, normal size guys under. And I say normal because average size guys, what they say, five ten, one hundred and fifty five, one hundred sixty five pounds. A cruiserweight is never going to work as the in the main event at Madison Square Garden or WrestleMania against the Big Show or ever against the Hopefully God bless him, Andre the Giant. <laughs> uh, He's never going to be, you know, Stone Cold. Austin is probably the shortest guy that they've ever, that they've had in a long, I say ever, but a long time, That's uh, that made it as a WWF World's Champion. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's just something that, that, yeah, that they angle. don't do. Yeah, angle. Bigger guys are the guys that people, that I think people really come to watch these big, ferocious, uh, gigantic people you know, pound on each other. I don't think you really care about seeing guys at the same size as your neighbor. Yeah, and uh, it's not a knock on the cruiserweights. I'm telling you, it's not. But you see what they did with them. I think in WCW they had Steiner go out and just kill them all. But you know, it, obviously somebody's booking WCW must have heard something I said. I would take this Scott Steiner and I would make him an absolute killer. I'd make him a killer. I, well, that's I mean, exactly I was, what they're trying I'd, to do. I'd spotlight that body of his, I, I, you know, and, and I'd make this guy a killer. I'd have him squeezing guys till their eyes pop out. The only the only problem is they have no one to put him against. The only one they had is Goldberg, and you know they never can get him going after. You know, well, they, after they Kevin got... Nash beat him, you know, that was well. The first guy I'd say was okay. Nash, look, brother, you know you're getting this one point five million dollar contract, and uh, here's what you're gonna do tonight. Well, I'm not doing it. Okay, fine, you're out of here. So we saved one point five million. Hogan, <laughs> you're on a four million dollar deal. Listen, here's what we got for you tonight. Scotty Steiner's going to squeeze you, and you're going to bite the bite the alka is going to drip out of your mouth. You remember that old angle, Dave? Yeah. And he's going to squeeze the life out of you. Oh, I'm not doing it. We just saved four million, pal. You're out of here. <laughs> and 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 if you you can't do any worse. You're already doing. You know, you don't have any ratings anyway. You're going to have to do something. you got to build somebody, and they need to build this guy, and they need to rebuild uh, uh, Goldberg down there because he was a, uh, un it was just incredible. I, that's the one time I did talk business with Jimmy Hart. I called him. I said, Jimmy, I cannot believe this. I can't believe you guys let this happen. I can't believe it happened. You killed, you killed the one guy that people wanted to watch. I turned in to watch this guy. I was a mark for him. I wanted to see who was going to be next. Mm -hmm. Just incredible how they killed that business. That, that whole thing, that whole thing. They didn't know. Oh, period. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, they didn't know what they had. It, it snuck up on them, and then it was just it it, it, it got so big so fast. It was jealousy. They, oh, of course it was. That, that was jealousy there. That yeah. wouldn't have yeah, happened from, in a WWF. From, from from from. Yeah, from 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 all of them. It was uh, it was one of those things. I mean, the minute he got the belt, if you remember that time period, the minute he got the belt. All of a sudden, he got moved to the semi-main events with the belt, and Hogan became the top, and that's when he started going down. And then when Nash beat him, the bloom was totally off the road. Well, I guess Nash was, had gotten over in the booking committee and was in charge of booking, so the first match he booked was him winning the world belt. But, you know, to me, and then you hear, like I said, when Bobby says the business not run down there by wrestling people, it's the wrestlers that kill that place. Yeah. Well, this is the, pro the problem is, is when you've got active wrestlers that are headline wrestlers, you know, they're they're going to book to make themselves headline wrestlers. And Nash, you know, Nash's big thing was if he could be the first one to beat Goldberg with a feather in his cap, so that's the first thing he did. And then, you know, he cut his deal with Hogan and dropped the belt to Hogan right away afterwards. So Hogan got what he wanted. Nash got what he wanted. And uh, they, you know, they killed Goldberg dead. You know, the, the sad thing about that, that whole situation there in the WCW, and I don't know if it'll change, is the reason they did what they did, they didn't have to answer to anyone for their paychecks. Whether it be Bischoff, whether it be the booking committee, whether it be the TV people, they, no one had to answer to anyone for their paycheck. And, and that's that's essentially what happened to that company. Tomorrow on the show, we're going to have Rick Bassman of Ultimate Pro Wrestling. We'll be talking about his show, which is on the 21st. 
And on Friday, we're going to have Jim Hurd from WCW. You never, you never worked for Jim Hurd, did you? No, I, I, that was the conversation I had with uh, Jim Barnett. And, and Jim Hurd was in, uh, was, uh, no, let's see, how did that go? It was Jimmy Crockett. Then Jim Hurd came along. And, and, and Jim Hurd went on vacation or something, or if I forget how it happened. Anyway, Jim Hurd got dismissed from the company somehow, and I missed him. And this Kip Fry came along, and, and he was working with Jake's contract, got Jake a deal, called me and said he was going to start on mine. They fired him and brought in Bill Watts, and I knew I was dead there, so that was it for me and WCW. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, I just kind of missed out on a few things, but uh, I, I don't know. I guess it all worked out. Uh, you know, I just heard you plug the uh, Bassman and the UPW. I did the Fox uh, uh, Fox Sports Net, or what, what does it call? Uh, FX, Fox FX, where we did the Tough Man. Oh, the Tough Man contest. Tough That's man against, against, uh, the, the, the team, yeah. Fox, wrestlers against football players. And they used Bassman's group out of, uh, out of California. And while we were doing this thing, I told them, I said, you know, uh, Somebody from the WWF is going to see you guys on here, and you, a couple of you get a contract. Well, it didn't happen that way, but WWF, shortly after that show aired, and that's the, the highest-rated show that they have on that station at that time slot, ended up, uh, I guess, getting in bed with those guys, and they're uh, like a farm club on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they kind of really wonder about the Royal them. Rumble, because that particular show played on the Friday night prior to them calling me on the Wednesday. Oh, the uh, re- re- rerun of it. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, the rerun. They run, the thing runs about once or twice a month, and I get a lot of publicity off of that. People see me, you know, when I go out and do these shows now. Hey, I saw you on that Tough Man. I saw you on Tough Man. So it's, yeah. it's, it's you know, it, that's been a big boost. Matt, 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 Skir- Matt Skirshen is, uh, does the announcing on the Tough Man. I don't know if he did it on that show, but he did it on a lot of them. Yeah, you know, uh, they, a great concept. They, they, they gave it a show away in Detroit. It cost about 600 grand to put it on that night and do all of it. It was a great, great show, good atmosphere, had about 8,000 people. It went a little bit long up until about midnight. Uh, the thing they did, though, was really, really you know, a nice little twist you know, on cutting edge. You, Football against pro wrestlers, pro football. So you think you're going to see Emmett Smith and Troy Aikman and, and <laughs> yeah, I know. you know, and, and all these guys, and you think you're going to see The Rock and you're going to see uh, Stone Cold, and then they, they announce the football players. No one knows any of them. Lawrence Taylor's the only guy they know on football because he's doing commentary. He's and then an they announce answer, yeah. the wrestlers, boy, the, plus the place is getting ready, and they're, they're rumbling. Here, out comes these guys. They don't know any of them. <laughs> And then I was the last guy to go out, so I got a big round of applause and the eruption from the crowd because I was over real good in Detroit anyway. So other than myself and and and, uh, uh, and the other and the football Lawrence Taylor, no one on that show was known at all at all. So it's been a, it's been a case of people tune in to watch it because they they really think they're going to see something. Now this is a uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you even worked for this group, but this is Richard Sullivan's asking. Uh, do you have any stories about the Knoxville group that Flair Mulligan and Jim Crockett owned? I know that Mulligan, Les Thatcher, and Kevin Sullivan ran the company. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a good one. Jack uh, Jack left. He, Jack Mulligan takes over this thing, brings Kevin Sullivan, uh, myself, and Calvin, Kevin. We left Memphis as part of the Jimmy Hart's original first family of wrestling, and uh, we came over to Knoxville. And Kevin's going to do the booking for Jack. And Jack's there for a couple of weeks. In fact, that's where Barry started. Barry Wyndham was his first matches there. Terry Taylor's first matches were there uh, before he was a Red Rooster. Can you imagine a guy in WCW taking a finish or having Terry Taylor, the Red Rooster, tell you to do something? <laughs> Please. Look, here's how I think you can really get over. Oh, come on, Rooster, you never got over. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, anyway, that's, Jack leaves that's, that's and goes to Japan. That's actually what they say about his back. <laughs> Jack leaves and goes to Japan, and the business just falls to nothing. Crockett was supposed to send us some help over from Charlotte with the, you know, the big key players over there. He never did. So then Jack gets back. The towns are terrible, and he doesn't have the money to pay us. And you know, he says, "Can you get? Will you guys just stick with me for a few weeks? I can't afford to pay you." I said, "Jack, if you can't afford to pay me, brother, I can't afford to stay." Yeah. But anyway, it stayed. That's what happened. That's where I met uh, Dave Ebner in the very beginning, and his brother Earl. They were uh, Dave was referee, and Earl was uh, the, pulling the ring in their in their old school bus. This is uh, this reminds this is a, an email about uh, the scene in, you were in Wrestling with Shadows. In the car with Bret Hart, Davy Boy, and Jim Neidhart talking about Shawn Michaels and everything. Um, what, what was that? Was that scene actually uh, like right before the right before Montreal? Uh, yeah, it was the day before that happened. We went over to the uh, TSN studios. Uh, what they? I felt. I once again, I came in on the back end. Owen, God bless him, great guy. One of the, he's the best of all that bunch. 
Owen was to go with D- Davy and Brett and Jim, and, and the, Davy, Brett, and Owen were going to do an interview about the Hearts and the Hart family and wrestling, and the, Brett had his own interview to do there. Uh, it was a two-segment deal. Uh, Owen had to go do some PR work for the office somewhere else and was couldn't make it, so I was just standing there once again, standing around like a, you know, somebody didn't know what he was doing. They said, "You used to work for the Hearts, didn't you? Yeah, get in the car and go with them, do this interview. What kind of just just go?" And the film crew was in the car, and that's how that all happened. What were your thoughts as far as uh, the what 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 actually what was in the conversation that night? Because that's right before Montreal. Were uh, they? Were they talking about a screw job? Was Brett real adamant about anything, or was it not even something they were worried about? No, it was never brought up in the car or around me at all. It was nothing said about it. Brett was excited about He was disgusted about the way the WWF was going and, and maybe his chances in WCW and all that. And I just come out of the WCW uh, like the year before that or so. And, and I knew that if you got, and I told him, if you, you know, you're going there on a contract, everything's fine. Everybody's under contract. There's no pressure. No one cares. I mean, there is no pressure. No one cares there. You just go there and collect a big paycheck, and it doesn't matter. Nobody bothers you. Uh, but anyway, him. And, see, the thing was, him and uh, Shawn Michaels had already three or four weeks before that in Hartford, Connecticut, were down on the floor in a locker room and uh, kept pulling each other's hair out. I mean, fighting. Uh, and they pulled those guys apart like three weeks before that. And I so that, actually, that was, was that was uh, several months before, but yeah, it was in Hartford. Well, yeah, right. it was, uh, I, I didn't know exactly how, how what the time frame was. I, it's fresh in my mind. It was hard for Connecticut, uh, but anyway, I just I know Brett. I know Brett's not going to do the job in the middle of the ring for anybody. I don't care whether it's Canada or where. He never does that. He never did it. And I knew just personality wise that Shawn Michaels wasn't going to do the job for Bret Hart. So I mean, you got two guys there just not going to cooperate. So uh, I think Vince. For the good of the company, for the good of his own benefit and his company, he probably did the best thing. Uh, was to do it that way or just cancel a match. So you go out and have the match. I mean, it's nothing new in our business. People get uh, the old steely down up the backside all the time. Well, By this point, do yeah. you think Brett was cool with the idea of just going to WCW and just getting a paycheck? No, Brett's not that kind of guy. Brett's a, Brett's a, 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 a real professional. He was... You know, he knew he could make an impact there. And, and not only that, they were taking a major player. Here's Brett in the main event at a major uh, pay-per-view for the WWF. The world and, champion. And within, you know, 48 hours, he was going to be on Nitro. So, uh, uh, you know, it was a, a big deal. And they, they had contacted Anvil. And uh, and, and then uh, Shane McMahon had pulled Anvil off to the side after after uh, uh, Brett had, had smacked Vince. The next day we were in... Uh, uh, and in one of those uh, Ontario Ottawa. towns or somewhere, and uh, but he had co- called him off the side, offered him a big contract to stay because see, Anvil was involved in the main event also, and then Rick Rude was involved in it. So you got all these key players in your main event that you know, 24 hours later they're showing up at your at your competition's TV. Yeah, but WCW didn't know what to do when, when they had him. Well, there. Well, now Dave, you got to remember, it's not run by wrestlers. <laughs> they're not <laughs> wrestling right people. Ah, <laughs> uh, they uh, Who knows? Uh, you know, who knows what they did? They they made they just they they stumbled over stuff and ruined it. Did I talk to out. you after uh, this, the Montreal show about boycotting Raw the next night? And no, it was never uh, never came up that I know of. I I heard a little scuttlebutt about it in the locker room. I was dressing beside Brett when that afternoon, and Rick Rude was across the way and. I left, you know, I didn't have anything to do, and shortly after the show started, I called a cab, went to the hotel, drove to the town the next day, and see these guys, everybody's all humble and somber, and I walk up to Jim Ross, and, you know, I'm chirping, want to say hello, and I said, hey, what'd you boys do last night anyway? And he looked at me like, hey, what are you trying to, am I a smart ass or what? But I didn't know they did anything. Rick Rude pulled me to the side and said, hey, man, Brett, he beat up Vince last night. What? Ah, <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Nah. He told me the whole story. He was in there when it happened. And it happened just like all the reports say. If you don't get out of here by the time I put my pants on, I'm going to knock you down. And he did. Yeah. Um, were you shocked? I mean, you know, here's a guy that, you know, if the reports are true, you got a 20, uh, what is it, 20-year deal for $2 million a year. That's $40 million. What do you want to beat your boss up over? He's giving you $40 million. 
Because yeah, he, he reneged on it. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't get, he, he had a 20-year deal, and then a year into the deal, Vince goes, uh, you know, remember that 20-year deal? Uh, wanna, it was supposed to be like a 20-year deal at $2 million, and that made Sean mad. So, you know, now I hear that Sean's going back to the WWF. and I, I, I Sean's just, going back, yeah. I can just see that, uh, you know, probably Nash got a hold of Sean and said, hey, look, Eric's coming in. We're going to get this thing going. Come back and go with us. And, you know, he's, he, he's probably talks to Hunter, and, and, you know, Hunter's not being treated very well right now, and then, and, and so, uh, there's, there's... I think Hunter's being treated real well. <laughs> there's going to be some attitudes going on. Yeah, but, you know, here's Austin getting a big spot at WrestleMania, and Austin's been gone for a year, Hunter's been carrying the company, it's kind of a slap in the face. Mm. I think there's going to yeah. be problems there. Well, Or he'll Sean... get himself in that main event. Or, yes, right, or they'll or, or figure out a way to get it, make it a three-way. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. Let's go to Jeff in Alberta. Jeff, you're going to be our last caller tonight. Hi, Dave and Brian and uh, Honky Tonk Man. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, awesome. I actually wanted to ask you about uh, Wrestling with Shadows, but uh, I guess you answered that pretty good. Um, what I wanted to ask is, uh, do you have a website, or do you just contribute all over the place, or what? No, that, that's all. I just, whoever whoever asks me to do something for them, I do. I, I don't do the website thing. I, I just never, it, it's... It got cluttered with wrestling and with wrestlers, and, 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 and people have taken up domain names and things, so I just kind of leave it alone. Okay. Um, do you have, have any connections to Calgary anymore, or not really? No, not at all, uh, other than my wife being a Calgarian, and I was up there last year for three or four days, but I was working over in Vancouver and British Columbia for those guys, and I was just in Calgary for a couple of days. Other than that, no. I did play golf there. It was a nice golf course. Okay, Awesome. Hey, actually, one more thing about Wrestling with Shadows. Maybe you can answer this, because I've never really heard a good good answer for it. But why exactly were they letting him film that? Uh, it, was uh, a deal with WWF, it was actually a deal the WWF set up with uh, High Road Productions. Uh, they wanted to do a, you know, a deal. Uh, you got you got to remember the time frame of all this, okay, um, with, with the Wrestling with Shadows and also with uh, Beyond the Mat. The WWF was losing in the ratings to WCW. Right. And They're they were just looking... Friendly. So they were very friendly, and Bret Hart was their number one star, and this was a Canadian film that was going to create this aura of Bret Hart as this Canadian hero, and that's exactly what Vince wanted. And, you know, that filming of that movie was done in August. Uh, at the, at the, it was the, the climax of the movie was supposed to be Bret Hart winning the title from um, Undertaker in the match where Sean interfered. Right. And then that was it. Bret, you know, Bret struggles, and he turns down that offer, and, and he wins the world title, and, and it, we have a happy ending. And then what happened was... Uh, right before, I guess a week before the thing in Montreal, Brett, Brett called them up and just goes, you know, um, there may be something interesting. You know, I think, I think Brett used them as an insurance policy, quite, quite frankly. And so they were with him everywhere when that thing was going down, and they got a hell of a movie out of it. Yeah, it's, uh, they followed this guy around for six months, and Brett's not the most exciting guy to follow around, I can tell you that. But <laughs> they followed him around for six months, and the last 48 hours, they got some of the best film footage they could have ever, ever have gotten. You know what's funny too is, and I didn't even know this, but there's some awesome footage that they had that they didn't put in the movie from that same frame, just because uh, one of the agreements they had was that Undertaker would never be shown out of character, and and I, I actually have, have talked to people who've seen it, um, the, the actual footage, some of the footage with Undertaker, you know, he was furious at Vince for what Vince did, and he was pounding on Vince's door. You know, all you, know, you probably all heard the stories, you know, Undertaker pounding on the door. They have that footage, but because of the agreement that they made with WWF that. Undertaker and Stone Cold would be the two guys that they would never show out of character. The WWF, those were the only ones they wanted to protect. They could show Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, anyone else in the company any way you want, but they just wanted to protect those two. So out of basically the fact that, of that promise, all that footage of Undertaker, you know, really blowing up, he was the one who really blew up after that, except uh, uh, aside from Bret, uh, they didn't air any of it. So, uh, I don't know. Hmm. Okay, thanks for clearing that up for me, man. <laughs> they they did okay. get some good footage. Yeah, they did. They didn't get the punch though. They almost, they almost got it. They got Vince staggering out though. Yeah, that was uh, that would have been worth seeing. Uh, you know, gosh, I would like to see that. <laughs> I love to see a good would. tussle. Yeah. Not, anyway, not, not 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 one of those, you know, real real dirty ones or anything, but just a good little tussle is good. It's good yeah. for morale. <laughs> that was pretty interesting. Hey, we're we're totally out of time. I can't even ask you this question. So, well, okay, okay. Now you were there in in, uh, in uh, were you there when Vince gave the speech after that? Yeah. You know where he was explaining his side of the story of yeah, like you know said, what? Yeah, yeah. This is what's really good. This is a good part of the whole thing. I looked around the room and kind of like, holy hell! Why don't you help me? He said, I helped Brett get his deal. I helped Brett get his 
three-year, three million dollar deal, a deal worth about nine million dollars. I helped him negotiate that. I help, we're all going. Well, hell, why don't you help us then? <laughs> help us get that same deal. I know Vince is there, and uh, he took it, he took it for the company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that was something. But uh, uh, you know, he explained it in a way that was that really should have satisfied everyone and. Uh, you know, you get into this business, if you don't know stuff like that's going to happen, brother, you better wake up and smell the roses because it, it happens every day. It happens in booking meetings, agent meetings. It happens uh, on, on, on every in every aspect of the wrestling and professional sports and entertainment business. It's, it's not, you know, the sweetest thing. It's a lovely business, but it is dirty. Now, what would have happened if you were in the ring on that NBC thing and somebody would have done something to you? And all of a sudden, they would have double crossed you, you know, because well, it was actually I, a very similar situation. Oh yeah, I probably would have punched him too. I, <laughs> <laughs> there, would have, there was, there would have been, a, with me, there's a, a pecking order of punches. So, you know, if I'd have seen Strongbow, I'd have punched him first, and then, you know, uh, uh, if I'd have seen Lanza, I'd have got him next, or he'd have probably ran from me. I'd have probably run to try to hit him. Uh, uh, but uh, then I would have eventually, but, you know, Bad News tried this, and Vince locked himself in a room, so Bad News couldn't get to him. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta, if you're going to make that punch, you got to really, con you got to kind of hide it, you know. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you very much for doing the show, and uh, we'll be having you on soon, hopefully. And I want to remind everyone, we'll be back tomorrow at 5.